You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Head Coach with host and board-certified psychiatrist, Dr. Scott Bay. Dr. Scott is here to discuss topics in today's mental health to help you better understand psychiatric illness, reducing the stigma surrounding diagnosis and treatment, and exploding myths and stereotypes about the mentally ill. Dr. Bay will take your calls and address your questions with advice based on sound science and, most of all, with compassion. So please welcome the host of The Head Coach, Dr. Scott Bay. This is your host, Dr. Scott Bay, coming to you live on the BBM Network and TuneIn Radio. And your psychiatrist with all the latest mental health-related news, bringing you anything and everything about the mind, the brain, human behavior, how to feel well emotionally, how to cope better with stress, and I'll be bringing you all kinds of updates on the latest research into potential causes and new treatments for mental illness, also periodically updates on children's mental health issues, stress in the workplace, military and veterans' mental health, and along the way just trying to promote better mental health and wellness by improving knowledge about how to achieve those things and also to shed some light on some information you may not be able to get from other sources about mental health issues and we'll try to keep everything in context with what's going on in the world lately and also want to answer your questions as uh, someone who wants to be your resource for mental health information and advice um, available to you. And during the show, if you have a question about any mental health issue, something that you're dealing with or someone close to you, or maybe you have a comment about something that I've discussed on the show, or maybe you want me to comment on something that you've heard or read about, please feel free to give me a call. The number is 866 866- 451-1451. Again, the number is 866-451-1451. You can also reach out to me via email. And that email address for me is Dr. Scott, which is spelled D-R-S-C-O-T, just one T, at yahoo.com. Again, that email address, D-R-S-C-O-T at yahoo.com. Well, I want to start out tonight's show by talking to you about conspiracy theories and the people who believe in them. We are certainly experiencing a lot of this type of thinking and promotion of bizarre and outlandish ideas about multiple topics uh, relating to politics, the election, and the outcome of it relating to the COVID pandemic, conspiracy theories abound. And this is not a new thing. They've been with us for a very long time. But one of the controversies I want to address regarding them is, do conspiracy theories represent mental illness? Does someone who harbors these beliefs have a mental illness? Are conspiracy theories the same as harboring delusions, which is a sign of a mental illness, um, psychosis. When people are reading and hearing about some of the bizarre and absurd ideas that conspiracy theorists promote, many people turn to myself and other mental health professionals and say, 
surely these people must be mentally ill. Well, the surprising answer is probably not. Conspiracy theories are often received with psychiatric connotations associated with paranoid plan hatchers and non-believing outsiders. But whereas theories such as QAnon, for example, strain credibility for many people, the argument is that they are likely not the product of psychosis or mental illness, nor do conspiracy theories in general represent delusions. And when many people across the country, not to mention in public office, believe that the world is run by a group of satanic pedophiles that includes top Democrats and Hollywood elites, that's uh, the QAnon believers, and that former President Trump is leading a secret mission to bring these evildoers to justice, one can't help but ask if they're at least to some degree mentally impaired. Well, for one thing, surveys have consistently revealed that about 50% of the population believes in at least one conspiracy theory. 50%, half of us. That would mean half of us are mentally ill, which uh, surely is not the case. Furthermore, there are several substantive differences between conspiracy theory beliefs and delusions, and we'll be going over the differences between them shortly. Some researchers consider conspiracy theories to be a subset of false beliefs. But most scholars do not prejudge their validity or veracity. Real-life conspiracies, such as the CIA's MK Ultra program, have clearly occurred throughout history. Belief in conspiracy theories is distinct from psychosis and more closely resembles extreme but subculturally sanctioned religious or political beliefs. However, the line between believing in conspiracies and being delusional becomes blurred when the believer becomes part of the conspiracy theory and feels compelled to act on the belief as a part of a personal mission. Take Edgar Madison Welch, a 28-year-old man who firmly believed the so-called Pizzagate conspiracy theory, the baseless claim that Hillary Clinton and Democratic allies were running a child sex trafficking ring out of a Washington, D.C. pizzeria. Seeing himself a potential savior of children, Welch drove 350 miles to the pizza shop from his home in North Carolina in December of 2016 and fired three shots from an AR-15 style rifle into a locked closet door, ultimately surrendering to police. However, on questioning, he quickly conceded the intel on this wasn't 100%. Given that half the population believes in at least one conspiracy theory, it should come as little surprise that there is no reliable profile for believers. Although some studies have suggested associations with low education, right-wing political orientation, and certain personality traits like paranoia, such findings have been inconsistent and may vary across a specific conspiracy theory. Associations between conspiracy belief and paranoia suggest overlap with a conspiratorial mindset, with recent evidence that distrust of officialdom is a key mediator between believing in conspiracies and political ideology. So again, it isn't just people who subscribe to one political ideology or another. Usually it would include a general overall distrust of people in authority and having a mindset that includes suspicion, distrust of others in general. Other quantitative cognitive quirks reported in those who believe in conspiracies are a need for certainty and control, 
a need for uniqueness. Illusory pattern perception, in other words, seeing patterns where there are none, and a lack of analytical thinking. You can understand at difficult times as we're going through the certainty and control aspect. When there are nothing going on around us but disasters everywhere you look, the fear driven by all of that will drive a need for certainty and control. And sadly, for some people, conspiracy theories and groups that promote them will provide that. And then you have some factors that may provide for universal cognitive explanations for conspiratorial beliefs versus those that might be related to specific beliefs, such as the need for certainty during times of crisis and societal upheaval, like what we're having now, when conspiracy theories tend to flourish. Well, we will continue this discussion of conspiracy theories and mental illness, or the lack thereof, after this commercial break. You're listening to The Head Coach, coming to you live on the BBM Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Bay. Please stay tuned. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. Welcome back to The Head Coach, coming to you live on the BBM Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Bay, your psychiatrist with all the latest mental health news and information we're talking about conspiracy theories and the believers in them and how believing in conspiracy theories doesn't necessarily make you mentally ill. Now, conspiracy theory belief may be thought of as having a couple of different components. The first component is overall global mistrust, mistrusting conventional authoritative knowledge. The second component involves biased information processing, which goes along with exposure to misinformation, often transmitted by word of mouth or through social networks. So according to this model, believing in conspiracy theories could be conceived as involving delusion-like beliefs, but not full-blown psychosis or delusions as one might see, for example, in someone who suffers from schizophrenia. So, let's take a look at the difference between conspiracy theories and delusions, because I can well understand to uh, anyone who has some good sense, they might think, what, you mean these 
people's beliefs aren't delusions? Surely they have to be. Well, let's see the distinctions. So first of all, there's a difference in terms of the correspondence to reality. Usually, conspiracy theories are false, but occasionally prove to be true, whereas delusions, by definition, are false beliefs. And as far as conspiracy theories' origin, it lies mostly in externally provided information, news media, social media. But delusions usually arise from within the own person's thoughts, their own very individual and unique response to some sort of external and or internal stimuli, often a component of a disease process. And then there's the differences between the two according to the degree of sharedness or communality. With conspiracy theories, there's a marked degree of sharedness and communality. It's often linked with the community of like-minded individuals and promoted by them. Whereas with delusions, there is no sharing. It's someone's own unique individual beliefs, and the delusions refer to the person and are personalized. And then there's the differences in terms of information processing. With conspiracy theories, information processing is biased with respect to the content of the conspiracy. And again, this is often guided by the community of like-minded individuals who harbor the same beliefs. When there is someone who has a delusion, their information processing is markedly abnormal with respect to the cont, uh, the uh, content uh, of the delusion. And then you have the degree and characteristics of the mistrust. When it comes to conspiracy theories, there's often pervasive mistrust of authority, experts, science, government, whereas a person who harbors delusions their mistrust is usually more localized around a specific particular idea, one specific individual or group. And then there are differences with respect to hallucinations. For people who have conspiracy theories, it's probably rare that they would suffer from hallucinations. In other words, actually seeing or hearing things that aren't there. Unfortunately, in people who have a psychotic illness such as schizophrenia, it is common that they would have these very disturbing experiences. And then there's the level of social vocational impairment. With people who believe in conspiracy theories, that may be minimal, but may be there. Shockingly, people who believe in conspiracy theories may not be angry, isolated loners who are incapable of having social interactions or incapable of holding down very successful careers. Whereas for people who have a mental illness and are suffering from delusions, there's often very severe levels of social and vocational impairment. Essentially, delusions are fixed, false, usually unshared beliefs often based on a subjective inner experience. The delusion's content is referred to as being self-referential. That is, it's focused primarily on the believer. In contrast, conspiracy theories are usually, but not necessarily false, and they're typically shared beliefs that don't explicitly or directly involve the believer and are based on evidence that one finds out there such as on the internet. This speaks to the highly communal nature of so many conspiracy theories, networks of like-minded individuals reinforcing one another's beliefs in a particular socio-cultural context. As for medical conspiracy theories, none have flourished recently more so than those involving the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Some conspiratorial claims include assertions that COVID-19 is a hoax, arguments that the virus was created artificially and spread on purpose as a bioweapon. Well, we will take another commercial break for now, but when we come back, more on conspiracy theories and mental illness, the differences between the two. You're listening to The Head Coach, coming to you live on the BBM Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Bay. Please stay tuned. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of career current concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. Welcome back to The Head Coach, coming to you live on the BBM Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Bay. You're a psychiatrist with all the latest mental health-related news, trying to promote better mental health and wellness, trying to promote better knowledge of mental health issues. Also, taking your phone calls, any mental health-related questions you have, give me a call, 866 451 one four five one again eight six six four five one one four five one right we're talking about how even people who believe in bizarre absurd baseless conspiracy conspiracy theories do not necessarily suffer from mental illness and right before the break we're going over some of the medical conspiracy theories about COVID, for example. Lots of conspiracy theories around that. Uh, Allegations that governments are using the emergency situation to pursue their anti-democratic goals. Other conspiracies argued that people in power are taking advantage of the pandemic as a plan to inject microchip quantum dot spy software and monitor people. Yes, folks, it's Hard not to characterize that as a delusion representing a mental illness, but it is not. A key difference between COVID-19 and the Spanish flu pandemic of the year 1918 is that now we have a highly interconnected world. To a greater extent on social media, it is setting the stage for distributing misinformation about COVID-19. So let's consider the following composite clinical vignette. Mr. A, a 70-year-old retiree with a history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, has been advised by his primary care physician to get the vaccine against COVID-19. He's extremely reluctant to do so, fearing that the vaccine is going to change my DNA and might even give me COVID. 
He has heard from friends on social media that vaccine developers faked the results and are in cahoots with the federal government. Mr. A has heard experts declare the vaccines safe, but does not trust them. He has no psychiatric or substance abuse history. There are no cognitive, perceptual, or other abnormalities in Mr. A's mental status exam. So Mr. A's beliefs clearly qualify as a conspiracy theory, but probably represent widely held misconceptions about COVID-19 vaccines, as well as widespread mistrust of pharmaceutical companies and the federal government. Based on the information provided, there is no basis for concluding that Mr. A is psychotic or delusional. His beliefs appear to be the result of mistrust of authoritative informational accounts, bias, information processing, and exposure to misinformation. So what would be the approach here? Well, one-to-one engagement with healthcare providers has proved to be effective in reducing vaccine hesitancy and correcting misinformation. For patients with less fixed conspiracy theory beliefs, it may sometimes be helpful to gently offer alternative hypotheses to the conspiracy theory using elements of cognitive behavioral therapy. For example, a physician might ask, is it possible that the online source you read was mistaken about the vaccine changing your DNA? While reminding patients that, contrary to popular belief, mRNA vaccines have been in development against cancer for several decades. Uh, mRNA is the technology that the new COVID-19 vaccines are based on. And some of what underlies the conspiracy theories about the COVID-19 vaccines is that they were developed so quickly, the data must have been fudged, corners must have been cut, they're not safe, they haven't been tested. None of that is true. The technology was there. It was applied to vaccines for the first time. So yes, that's novel. The speed was remarkable. But again, instead of raising suspicion, that should be something celebrated as a triumph of science. Because believing in conspiracy theories is often associated with a sense of uncertainty and feeling that one's life is out of control, medical interventions can be framed as ways of regaining control and appealing to patients' values. For example, by saying, hey, by getting the vaccine, you'll be more likely to stay in good health, protect your family, and do all the things you want to do. Get back to life as we used to know it before the pandemic. So there you have it, conspiracy theories, bizarre, outlandish, seemingly out of touch with reality or not, does not imply mental illness. Next up on the show, I want to talk some about where the mistrust of vaccines in general came from. And we're going to look at the issue of the wild conspiracy theory that childhood vaccines were associated with autism or autism spectrum disorder or ASD. And uh, some decades ago, a scientist published a paper in a very prestigious journal in the UK and it uh, proposed the idea that childhood vaccines were a cause of autism. Well, it came to light that the researcher manufactured all of his data, falsified all of his data. There was no truth to this whatsoever. And he was put up to it by an industry who had an agenda uh, that was in uh, contradiction to the vaccine industry. But we're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, don't miss it. We're going to talk about where all the conspiracy theories about vaccines came from. You're listening to The Head Coach, coming to you live on the BBM Network and TuneIn Radio. 
I'm your host, Dr. Scott Bay. Please stay tuned. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals listen to john hawkins my strategy saturdays 1 p.m eastern on the bbm global network and tune in radio according to the american nurses association there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the united states so where do all these nurses work what kind of roles do they have what kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings what kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes the world health organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse honoring the 200th birth anniversary of florence nightingale an international initiative called nurse Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back to The Head Coach, coming to you live on the BBM Network in TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Bay, your psychiatrist, all the latest mental health-related news. And we're talking about conspiracy theories, conspiracy theorists. We talked earlier on the show about how conspiracy theories do not represent being mentally ill, but still... They are very destructive because they promote false ideas, among them that childhood vaccines cause autism. Uh, The conspiracy theory came from a researcher who published a paper in a prestigious journal having falsified all of his data. And he was put up to this by an industry that had something negative uh, against the vaccine industry, the pharmaceutical companies who make them. So let me give you some history of this. And then also it will show that kids who get their vaccines actually have lower rates of autism than kids who don't. Now, no one would say that getting the vaccines protects against autism, but just giving you that information goes to tell you just how false the idea that vaccines cause autism is, and yet the idea continues to permeate in social media on the web to this day. So this was an editorial um, in a medical journal from April of 2018 um, from Dr. Paul Offit from the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And he's talking about a paper that had been published in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association Pediatrics Journal, a study by researchers at Kaiser Permanente Healthcare System in collaboration with researchers at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in Atlanta, where I'm coming to you from. And at issue were vaccination rates among children with autism spectrum disorder. The researchers looked at 3,729 kids with autism spectrum disorder, ASD, and compared them with almost 600,000 kids without it. They found that the kids with autism were statistically significantly less 
likely to be vaccinated than those without the disorder. They also found that the younger children whose older siblings had autism were less likely to be vaccinated than younger children whose older siblings did not have autism. Why is this happening? Well, the notions that vaccines cause autism was born in 1998. Andrew Wakefield and colleagues published a paper in The Lancet claiming that the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine caused autism. In the 20 years since then, 17 studies have shown that that vaccine does not cause autism. Also, in the late 1990s, the notion was born that thimerosal, which is an ethyl mercury containing preservative in vaccines, could cause autism. That, too, has been refuted with seven studies showing that thimerosal at the level contained in vaccines does not increase the risk for any neurodevelopmental delays, including autism. Then the hypothesis shifted again to the notion that children were just getting too many vaccines too early in life. That, too, has been examined in two studies that showed that this was not a problem in terms of increasing the risk for autism. But why do these fears persist? One of the many reasons is that we don't know the clear cause or causes of autism. We don't have a cure for it. So this idea just sort of hangs out there. There's a possible analogy to diabetes in the late 1800s when no one really knew what caused it. And there were a lot of crazy cures proffered by charlatans. In 1921, Benting and Beck discovered insulin and all those crazy cures and crazy ideas about what caused diabetes disappeared. So there are parents who are choosing not to vaccinate children with autism, which will only put them at risk for infectious diseases and does not in any sense lessen their symptoms of autism. Certainly for the younger siblings who aren't being vaccinated, it doesn't lower their risk of developing this disorder. It just puts them at risk for vaccine-preventable diseases. All these children are being put in harm's way with potentially tragic consequences. Now, lest you think that, well, what's the big deal? All these childhood diseases in decades past, parents used to bring kids together when one had chicken pox, so they would all get it and get it over with. Same with measles. And that's true. And while it is also true that even to this day, there are few children who have complicated courses of chicken pox or measles or rubella, what have you, it isn't necessarily a benign illness. There can be cases of measles encephalitis, a very, very serious situation where there is inflammation in the brain, and this can be very, very serious health problem, in a worst case, even fatal. So, so again, conspiracy theories about health-related issues, including vaccines, can be very damaging. And, you know, we're all coming up on a year of dealing with COVID, and we've been fed up and over with how our lives are different and how we can't have things like live sports, live music, freely going to restaurants, freely getting together in crowds. Well, the best way to get back to that is for everyone to get the shot as soon as possible and not to avoid the shot because of misinformation and lies. All right. Well, we'll switch gears and talk more about other mental health related subjects. How about the difference between live and in, uh, in-person therapy versus virtual therapy. We'll have that and more after this commercial break. You're listening to The Head Coach coming to you live on the BBM Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Bay. Please stay tuned. 
Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard, owner and CEO of House Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists, and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. Welcome back to The Head Coach, coming to you live on the BBM Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Bay, your psychiatrist with all the latest mental health-related news, promoting mental health and wellness, educating the public about mental health-related issues. And next up on tonight's show, therapy delivered electronically. Is it more effective than face-to-face therapy? In this day and age of COVID, how we are all staying socially distanced and we're conducting so many aspects of our lives virtually, that has now come to include psychotherapy, counseling. It's not like there wasn't such an option for counseling before the pandemic, but clearly now it's become much more prevalent, as have most healthcare interactions uh, now become uh, virtual to a large degree. But it turns out that uh, some people who studied this issue, even uh, much earlier on in the pandemic, have found that there was no difference in the level of satisfaction or function between psychotherapy in person, face-to-face, versus electronically. And in fact, um, a review led by researchers at McMaster University up in Canada found that cognitive behavioral therapy delivered electronically to treat people with depression is more effective than face-to-face therapy. And this was based on randomized controlled trials. Um, The review revealed that cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, that connected therapists and patients through such modes as web-based applications, video conferencing, email, and texting improved patients' symptoms better than face-to-face when measured using standardized mood symptoms scales. And again, there was no difference in the level of satisfaction or function between the two types of therapies. And Although they started the study before the pandemic, it is certainly timely and assuring that the treatment delivered electronically works as well, if not better, than face-to-face, and there's no compromise on the quality of care that patients are receiving during this very stressful time. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy, just to explain what that is briefly, it's a type of psychotherapy widely used to treat depression. It 
is based on the principle that negative thoughts or cognitions will lead to a negative emotion. And if you train the person to counteract the negative thoughts or cognitions with more positive ones, then their mood will follow. But there's limited resource availability, and this poses several barriers to patients seeking access to such care, including lengthy wait times, geographical limitations, lack of health insurance coverage, or limited health insurance coverage, just to name a few. So the researchers found a total of 17 randomized controlled trials comparing therapist-supported CBT delivered electronically to -to face-to-face CBT. And these studies were conducted over 15 years in places such as United States, Australia, Netherlands, Switzerland, Sweden, and the UK. Now, these findings debunk widely held perceptions about psychotherapy. The common understanding was that face-to-face psychotherapy has the advantage of the connection with the therapist. And this connection is in part what makes the difference in treatment. That principle is as old as uh, going back to Sigmund Freud's time. However, it is not surprising that electronic interventions are helpful in that they offer flexibility, privacy, and no travel time, no need to take time off of work, transportation, parking costs. It makes sense that people access care, especially mental health care, when they need it from their own comfort space. The findings definitely support advocacy and widespread implementation of electronic cognitive behavioral therapy. Electronic options should be considered to be implemented for delivering therapy to patients, and this can potentially vastly improve access for patients, especially those in rural or underserved areas and during pandemics. And remember, we talked in a previous show a week or two ago, I think it was, uh, there are some applications and websites for virtual therapy, betterhelp.com among them. Now, speaking of being socially isolated and socially distanced in the COVID-19, it turns out that having poor social skills can be harmful to your health. So while social skills deficits have long been linked to mental health problems like depression, a study links poor social skills to poor physical health as well. Those who struggle in social situations experience more stress and loneliness, which can take a toll on the body. And of course, now during the pandemic, when loneliness and social isolation is accentuated, that's going to cause even worse health problems. People with poor social skills tend to experience more stress and loneliness, and this can cause negative impacts on their health. Social skills are associated with mental health problems like depression and anxiety, and social skills are also predictive of poorer physical health. Two variables, loneliness and stress, appear to be the glue that bind poor social skills to poor physical health. And it's, again, the high stress and loneliness. The study was based on a national survey of people as young as 18, as old as 91, and they were asked to respond to online questions designed to measure social skills, stress, loneliness, and mental and physical health. What do they mean by social skills in the study? They're talking about communication skills that allow people to interact effectively and appropriately with others. And there are four specific indicators of social skills. The ability to provide emotional support to others, self-disclosure or the ability to share personal information with others, Negative assertion skills or the ability to stand up to unreasonable requests from others. 
and relationship initiation skills or the ability to introduce yourself to others and get to know them. Now, you can tell just listening to that list of description of social skills, can you imagine the imposed social isolation and stress and loneliness from COVID that would make that person even more disabled by all of this? So the people in the study who had deficits in those skills had more stress, more loneliness, poor overall mental and physical health. Now, we've known about the negative effects on physical health of stress for a long time, but loneliness is only a more recently recognized health factor. We started recognizing that as a health factor about 15, 20 years ago. It's actually a pretty serious risk for health problems. It turns out loneliness is as serious a risk as smoking, obesity, or eating a high-fat diet with a lack of exercise. That's right. Any of those health-related risk factors, loneliness is just as severe. The experience of loneliness to the way people feel when they're in a hurry to get out the door and can't find their keys, it's accepted feeling never goes away. All right, we'll continue our discussion of this when we come back from our next break. You're listening to The Head Coach, coming to you live on the BBM Network in TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Bay. Please stay tuned. MJ Domit is the owner of Expect to be Empowered, a company whose specialty is empowering people to live their best life by following their heart and accepting themselves unconditionally. After studying and making personal changes, MJ now focuses on giving others tools for self-empowerment. She provides individual and group workshops for people who are physically, emotionally, and spiritually blocked. Inspired by her work at Expect to be Empowered, MJ authored the book Waves of Blue Light, Heal the Heart and Free the Soul with a company empowerment cards she is a spirit book of the year gold medal living now book award winner and her book is a number one amazon bestseller in spirituality and was a 2012 gold medal winner recognized as the living now spirit book of the year an inspirational speaker mj will show you how you can repurpose every area of your life your life did not just happen to you you chose it which means you can change it visit www.expecttobeempowered.com or call 866-264-8024 Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from France. International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866 244 5679 and feel the glory. Welcome back to The Head Coach, coming to you live on the BBM Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Bay, your psychiatrist with all the latest mental health-related news. We're talking about poor social skills harming your physical health, not just mental health. And the key components to that damage are stress and loneliness. So the lonely person, we're using the analogy of losing our car keys. 99% of the time we find them. The stress of not being able to find them goes away. We get in the car, it's over. But lonely people are experiencing that same sort of frantic search, not for car keys, but for meaningful relationships. And there is no escape from that stress. They're not finding what they're looking for. And that stress of frantically searching takes a toll on them. The good news is that social skills have proved to be amenable to intervention. For people who really want to improve their social skills and work on them, there's therapy, there's counseling, there's social skills training. Unfortunately, however, many people who have poor social skills don't realize it. One of the problems with having poor social skills is lack of social awareness. 
So even if they're not getting the date, they're not getting the job, they're getting in arguments with coworkers or their spouse if they have one, they don't see themselves as a problem. They're walking around with this health risk factor and they're not even aware of it. The use of technology, texting in particular, is probably one of the biggest impediments for developing social skills in young people today. Everything is so condensed and parsed out in sound bites, and that's not the way human beings for thousands of years have communicated. It makes young people more timid when they're face-to-face with others, and they're not sure what to say, what to do. There's no social interaction, and that's really hurting young people. And I would also say people who are adults, but working from home exclusively, especially because of the pandemic, can see their social skills sort of atrophy and deteriorate. You stop having those normal everyday, all-day social interactions at work with coworkers, with customers, what have you, and it's like anything else, uh, a muscle that atrophies. Uh, If you don't uh, use it, you lose it. Uh, So again, something we need to keep in mind during the social isolation that we have to deal with in COVID. Well, that brings us to the end of tonight's show. I hope you enjoyed listening to the news and information that I enjoyed bringing to you. And I hope that until we get together again next time, you have a wonderful, stress-free week. But if not, then you need to call Dr. Scott. Good night, and thanks for listening. This has been The Head Coach with Dr. Scott Bay. Tune in each week as Dr. Scott discusses the latest findings in medical research and the causes and potential new treatments for mental illness, current events and controversies relating to mental health, children's mental health, military and veterans' mental health, and stress in the workplace. Here on Dr. Scott Bay's The Head Coach. been listening to the bbm global network the ideas views and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas views and opinions of the bbm global network company